My name is Patrick Matthews. This is my prison card. I was down in Dallas, Texas today working with some homeless people. Um, I think it's called the Soup Bowl. And a gentleman asked me if I was the police and I whipped out my prison card and I said, no, I'm just like you, I'm a prisoner. My number with the state of Pennsylvania was HB 2088. I spent five years in prison and because of some impropriety that uh, happened while I first got out of prison, I went back for six more months. I spent five and a half years of my life inside of prison. I grew up in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. What I knew about church was the women went to church and the men went to work. My family was an Irish Catholic, typical Irish Catholic family where everyone drank and um, used drugs. Everybody I grew up with was in the Warlocks Motorcycle Club. So I grew up thinking that was the natural progression from childhood into a motorcycle club. At six and a half years old, I was put in home. Um, it was Frontfield Hall, St. Gabriel's Hall, Methodist Home, and Children's Cottage. And as a little boy, things were happening to me that little boys shouldn't have done to them. And it caused a lot of grief and pain. And I learned very early on how to displace the anger and the pain that I was feeling. And I learned how to focus out of the pain by causing pain towards other people. When I was younger, I, I did things like raced motorcycles, drank alcohol, did drugs, sexual immorality, all kinds of things to keep the noise in my life up. And as long as I had the noise up, that quiet voice of Jesus Christ couldn't get in. So I found a way to keep Christ out by keeping the excitement up. When I first went into uh, Somerset Prison in Somerset, Pennsylvania, my wife called. She said she wanted a divorce. And I said, I, but I don't. And she says, but I do. And she hung up on me. And I was left in a pit of despair and anger. And I crawled around the floors of that prison for about two and a half to three years. And every day I thought about suicide. And something that Alcoholics Anonymous taught me long before, don't give up, hold on until tomorrow. So every day I had to fight and teach myself or to remind myself to breathe. And if I took one breath, then I could take a second and then I would get up and I take a shower and then go to the mess hall. And it's, it was a struggle for two and a half years to just live because I realized that by my own hands, I had pushed everyone I loved and cared about away from me. And when I was in prison, I had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, no one to, to pretend to or no one to uh, prop me up anymore. And in that desperation, I realized my life stunk and I had to change. And something that a man named David e Eby uh, said to me earlier, um, he looked at me one day and asked me where would I spend eternity? And I looked at him with all honestness honesty that I could, and I said, why do you care if I don't? And that, that question had to soak into my coconut, or my brain, for at least 20, 28 years before I realized that my life had become nothing. And I was in that prison cell, and I was fighting suicidal thoughts. I had lost everything, and I had nothing to turn to. And when I lost everything, that's when I started to go to the church. I had a lot of people that were talking to me about Jesus Christ, and I fought it. When I went into the church, I only went in to hear this one guy preach, uh, Reverend Brady. Every time he did, he was a Pentecostal, and the veins would pop out. And he came over to welcome me, and he wanted me to, wanted to thank me for coming, and did I enjoy the service? And I said, dude, I only come in here to see you stroke out. And that was my thinking. The only reason I was there was to cause trouble. I had gotten into fistfights in a prison when people talked to me about God. I didn't want to hear God. The nominal churches weren't feeding me what I wanted, and I turned to a plain church, Chambersburg Christian Fellowship, and I, I started to attend. Clyde Lehman was the bishop at that point. He came up to me and he said, you can stay for an entire service. Really? I didn't know that. I never felt 
like I wanted to. I never felt like anybody wanted me there. I, you know, I just had gotten out of prison and I thought I was the most worthless piece of slime on, work, on the world. And now I found this group of people um, who were playing Mennonites that allowed me to come in and sit. And then they asked me things like, do you want to come over for lunch? Yeah, okay. And it was the quiet love that they showed me that drew me in. If I go to a nominal church, and I always say nominal churches will tickle your ears, if I went to one, there would have been acceptance, but only to a point. And the Anabaptist church or the plain churches that I have in central Pennsylvania accepted me willingly as long as I repented of my sin and I submitted to that godly group of people and found a church, I had wide acceptance. And I never felt that true acceptance anywhere else in my life. I grew up in motorcycle clubs. I never felt the acceptance there because my acceptance in those groups were always based on my performance. And here I am with a group of people that just took me the way I was, wrecked, beat up, dent and bent. And they said, that's okay. I grew up as a heathen. I have no right to be sitting in their house. I had no right to be a member of that church by all accounts of the, what the world takes and looks at. I shouldn't have been there. And they welcomed me and they let me sit. And that's what I needed to come back from where I was at. And I have some of the best church brothers I've ever met. Most of the nominal churches that I know of have the no-till method of planting seeds. You don't disturb the soil, you just plant the seed and get off and causes little disruption in a person's life as you can possibly do. But as I read the Bible, I've realized that we're supposed to run a plow in as deep as we can, knowing that there's boulders and rocks under that soil, there are problems. And sometimes when we hit them rocks, that machine may break, might flip. You might even get killed running that machine. And then after we get done turning over that soil, we're supposed to take the most expensive seed we can buy and spread it out and turn around and never look back. We're supposed to go out and, and present the Bible the best we can so that people will see the kingdom of God and if they don't come to our church, we're supposed to be okay with that because they're at least going to the church. I've also been telling a lot of the young people that you're running away from the Mennonite churches and there's droves of people running towards. See value with what you have and realize that there are people seeking what you got. Don't abandon it quick. Before you leap away, look at what you're giving away because, okay, in 1962, they made some decisions in Mennonite Church of America. And they made a few adjustments that 25 years later, the Mennonite Church of America is completely liberal. Sometimes we do things today that three weeks from now we think have no repercussions. Unfortunately, the, everything that we do to change the way, and I know I'm not somebody that wants to reinforce the fences all the time, but if we make some dramatic changes in the course of events, we can change this thing forever. And it's been going for 500 years. I don't know. My life is complete today. And if I had to throw a bone to anybody, I'm 57. I have less years ahead of me than I do behind me. And I'm here in a plain community because I choose to be. And I see a lot of young people who grew up in a plain surrounding and because they have the outward appearance, they think they're involved. But it's a heart condition, not a outward appearance. I think one of our biggest faults as a plain church is to demand people to look a certain way on the outside and, and they miss the inside. There's a code an ethic code that the New Testament requires us to have in the way we present ourselves. Because if I present myself improperly to you as a candidate outside, 
I may cinch them from ever coming back. If I treat you roughly with you coming in, you may never come back. I may push your salvation to the side by something that I want to do because I want to amplify something. Job um, lost everything and he had everything restored tenfold. Well, I lost everything through my prison, experienced my sin nature, and I've been restored 13-fold. You know, I have 13 families in my life that if I want, I can go over to their house and I get to be a father, a grandfather, a brother, a friend. I never really had that before. I didn't know what true friendship was. True friendship to me was you were going to give me something and I was going to make you, whether through words, manipulation or something. I don't do this. I find no value in being the person that I was once. And I've gotten to listen to some very good teachers. And I listen to principles that intrigue me. I'm, I'm pretty lucky and blessed. You know, and today when I was in Dallas, I got to meet some people that were just the same way I was a few years ago. And I got to show some compassion that nobody showed me. And it was the compassion that the plain churches showed towards me. Just, I love where I'm at, at the end of my life, and I wish I could have done it in the beginning of my life. That's basically my life. I woke up one day and I, I didn't like who I was.